And good morning, all. We are live on Forging the Falcons on YouTube, and we're going to bring in our Facebook groups really quickly, Atlanta Falcons fans on All Falcons and Scott Kennedy Sports, because we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to come in here and talk some of the Atlanta Falcons. So good morning, everyone. This is Forging the Falcons. We are live on Facebook and YouTube. Appreciate you being here this morning. It will be just me and you this morning. Uh, Nick is out on a lottery winning one in 10,000 chance of winning a lottery ticket hike today. So I was like, yeah, dude, once in a lifetime, you got to go do that. So he's out. Uh, it will be just me today. So I need your help. I need your help with your questions in the chat, coming in on Facebook, coming in on YouTube. Uh, what do you want to talk about? Do we want to talk playoffs? Do we want to talk Cincinnati Bengals? Do we want to talk some injuries? Uh, do we want to talk Arthur Smith, rookies, Drake London, Arnold Ebiketti? There is plenty to talk about with this Atlanta Falcons team right now. We're going to hit on several of it. Uh, as we get started, um, I want to say hello to Thea. Thea coming in, saying good morning on YouTube. First one in. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. So thank you for coming in and saying hello. Uh, hit that like button. Um, if you are watching after the fact, about 80% of our audience on YouTube watch this on demand. Leave me a comment. Leave a comment after the fact. I want to come in and answer. If you hear something that doesn't make any sense, you disagree with, be respectful, anything like that, I will come in and I will follow it up. Uh, I'll probably say you were right. I didn't mean that or clarify or say, no, this is what I really feel. Uh, but leave me a comment. Come in on YouTube and uh, hit that subscribe button so you know when we are going live. Um, Want to hit some of the news real quick. Uh, of the injuries that came in on um, against the 49ers, the one that looked the scariest was when Casey Hayward went down a little awkwardly and came up with a tweaked shoulder. Uh, veteran cornerback signed to replace the ineffective Fabian Moreau last year. Got off to a little bit of a slow start, not totally unexpected in a complex Dean Peace system on defense, uh, but I thought he had really been playing well, and he's going to be a miss. Uh, Darren Hall came in and stepped up and played really well in his absence. That looks like who it will be to come in uh, in his place is cornerback Darren Hall, but Casey Hayward's going to be a miss. I like how physical he is out on the edge. Um, it was good to see Isaiah Oliver back. Isaiah Oliver was uh, kind of an embattled outside corner his first two years in the league, first three years in the league. Um, I mentioned about if you watched any of the Monday night game, the Denver Broncos have a rookie, Damari Mathis, that got called for four pass interferences. And I mentioned uh, on a Broncos pod, I said, you want to try and break that skid because you get that label. You get a label of a guy. If it's close, you're going to get a flag thrown on you. Isaiah Oliver was that guy. I was exactly thinking of Isaiah Oliver. It seemed like Isaiah Oliver was getting a PI every single time out there. He found a home in the slot position and a, as a slot corner, as a nickel corner for, for Dean Peace last year. It was playing fantastic before he hurt his knee. Almost one year to the day he is back, and he played really well. So that was a good addition. You start wondering, okay, do you move him outside? No, no, no. Leave him in the nickel slot where he is comfortable. You don't want to make the risk of weakening your place at two positions. So whoever comes in for him isn't going to be as good as Oliver, and Oliver's not going to be as good as as, as uh, Hayward on the outside. So you could end up weakening two positions instead of just one. Um Keep the strength going. Uh, luckily, A.J. Terrell, who was nursing a leg injury, said it was a hamstring. Uh, that's scary when 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 we see him hit the sidelines. Uh, whether or not you believe in the advanced analytics, he is a key member of this defense and someone that ha that they really need out there. And uh, it was good to see that he was uh, he was okay. They said it was precautionary. Uh, you know, if it was you know a playoff situation, a, a must win game, he probably could have gone back out there. Joe Cannon <clears throat> coming in on Facebook. Joe, great to see you as always this morning. Appreciate you being here. Love that photo um, of you. And looks, it's a child. Uh, hard to tell. Baby boy, baby girl. Can't tell for sure. Looks like a baby girl, but you never know for sure. Either way, I don't care. A happy dad, happy child. That's what I love seeing. So, Joe, uh, great to see you. Aiden Munnin coming in. Good morning. Aiden's got a story coming out on allfalcons.com today saying, is this team uh, a playoff contender or a, prender, a pretender? So look for that uh, this afternoon. 
shortly after we get off of this uh, this podcast, I'll get that edited and publish it for Aiden. Uh, it's doing a great job for us at allfalcons.com. Appreciate you, Aiden. Um, the other news coming in with some of the roster moves with uh, with Hayward going to the IR for four weeks or was an open roster spot, and they elevated Michael Pruitt, the tight end who had his first touchdown uh, reception with the Falcons. I, I find him a little bit interesting. When the Falcons make a signing, I try and, you know, we'll, we'll title it up to make it sound as good as possible. Former Philadelphia Eagles starter, maybe only started two or three games, but he still was a starter, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes other teams fans will come in and say, man, I didn't remember this guy or, you know, what do you mean he was a starter? He never started. I'm like, well, he started 14 games for you. That, that's a starter, dude. He may not have been good enough, but that's why he's on the Falcons practice squad now, but he was still a starter. But when Pruitt, signed and I put that on there the response on a, on uh the, the fa- our Facebook page which is if you want to check it out Atlanta Falcons fans on all Falcons I know a lot of y'all are coming in and watching from there the response came in from the Tennessee Titans fans was overwhelmingly positive man love this guy great signing he was playing so well before his injury he had a really nasty ankle injury in January I think it was uh week 17 before the, the second to last week of the season last year. Um, had, a, had a pretty nasty ankle injury, and it's taken some time for him to come back. But the the response was overwhelmingly positive, which you don't see very often. Um, so I was very, you know, it was like, okay, well, good. You know, not that, you know, the the social media verse is the, the, the best scouting department in the world, but you know, when you have fans who speak well of a former player, that's usually a good sign. It, it, it's usually a good sign. So um, <clears throat> he had his first touchdown catch, and I was actually listening to the game on the radio, listening to Archer's call, and uh, they go, you know, he it's touchdown, tight end, and you're like, oh, Michael Pruitt. And you're like, naturally, first touchdown to the tight end doesn't go to Kyle Pitts. Um, but it was a great play. You know, he sneaks out and, you know, just a little over the shoulder lob and catch Uh great play call, great execution. And then Pitts got his uh, a little bit later, but Michael Pruitt has been elevated uh, on a full-time basis. So signed to the 53 man active. He was a flex from the practice squad from that game. He has now been rewarded uh, with his good work in an open roster spot. And as he's getting healthy, cause he is a, he's a, a former starter, former, key player for the Tennessee Titans. This is a good football player that the Falcons got because he was injured. He had that. Some of the things the Falcons have had to do is, okay, we can sign this guy and we'll take some time. He's going to need less money because Hey, no one else to sign him because his ankles broke. Those are some of the things the Falcons have had to do with their salary cap constraints. And six weeks into the season, you're sitting in three and three and now you're getting, it's, it's kind of like a new signing, getting a healthy, talented, tight end to come in on your on a roster. So well done, uh, Terry Fontenot. Well done. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Pruitt. One moment while I take a big slug of coffee. I grabbed this mug specifically today. Uh, you all have seen this one before. It's my Star Wars mug. I feel like Arthur Smith needs to start taking this into his press conferences. Uh, this is my Darth Vader join us or die uh, mug. I've also called this my Nick Saban signing day coffee is for closers mug. But I thought this one would be um, a good one today for uh, for Arthur Smith and the way he is going with this franchise. Uh, join us or die. Um, another news: uh, the Falcons. You know, when you sign, when you elevate one guy, you get a couple. Uh, you get an opening on the practice squad. They brought back um, a couple of players. One of them I was very, very pleased to see uh, was linebacker Dorian Etheridge. Uh, Etheridge is a tackling machine in the preseason. So he had gotten hurt in the preseason, had an injury settlement, but has been signed and is now back on the practice squad. Very, very productive player. He's one of those guys that you could see coming up. Oh, this is his fourth year in the league and he's just getting his his first start. He had 20 tackles today. Dorian Etheridge is one of those guys. And then defensive lineman Jalen Dalton. They were both injured during the preseason. They have both been signed back to the practice squad. So congratulations to those gentlemen as well. Good work. So um, as the, the the algorithm bots are finding their way out into everybody's uh, browsers, we are starting to get some folks to come in, including our good friend, Chris Walker. 
Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and feeling good about the win against the 49ers. You know, Chris, that brings up another thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I'm interested. So listen up, because I want I want everybody's opinion on this. After that win, the Falcons rushed for over 100 yards. The offensive lineman, Arthur Smith, a former offensive lineman himself, uh, went up with his offensive lineman to the suite level. They went up into a suite in Mercedes-Benz Stadium and cracked open some beers in the celebration. What do you think about that? What was your uh, what was your reaction to to hearing that? And if it's your first time hearing it, what's your reaction to it now? Where uh, Jake Matthews, Eli Wilkinson, and it may have been some of the reserves too, Drew Dahlman, uh, Chris Lindstrom, and Caleb McGarry, starting five, went up into the suites, and and the boys had a couple beers together uh, after the fact with head coach Arthur Smith. What do you think? I'm uh, I'm interested in your take. So. Uh, and then I'll, I'll react to it as well. But Chris, thank you for coming in. I think I hope everyone is feeling good about the win against the 49ers. You read some of the comments on social media as the Falcons are starting to get some praise nationally for their good work and a good win over a, a good 49ers team. Some of the more salty 49ers fans were, well, it was the reserves or eight strings. Like, man, dude, everybody's got injuries. And you're talking about a Falcons team that had the 32nd worst roster in the NFL and is on their third and fourth running backs, rookie wide receiver, second-year tight end on a bum hamstring, retread quarterback. Man, no excuses. You know, this was a good win. Everybody's injured. I mean, yes, the 49ers had a ton of injuries, and maybe Bosa changes changes how some of those things happen. Maybe they do. Maybe Cordero Patterson does too. Maybe a healthy uh, Kyle Pitts has, has a little bit more going as well. So, you know, man, no excuses. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. Part of Arthur Smith's bristliness, his edge, is to change the culture of this team, is to get rid of any of the excuses. I don't care if you've only got half of your salary cap available. We're here to win games. And realistically, you know, they'll talk realistically behind closed doors, but they they present a united front and to change the culture of this team. And I it, it it might be as, as simple as, you know, the the football gods, instead of A.J. Terrell reaching out and that ball bouncing out of bounds for a touchback, which would be just the epitome of Falcons pain for the last 40 years, it stays in bounds. It stays in bounds and Jalen Hawkins falls on it for a touchdown to go up 14 to nothing. Um, those are the kind of things that happen to positive franchises. Not the ones that are always looking for ways to lose, uh, which, frankly, the Atlanta Falcons have been through the course of their history. And this is a culture change. So no excuses. No excuses. No excuses for Mark Schrader. Mark Schrader is coming off heart surgery, for goodness sakes, and he can find a way to get here. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Mark. Certainly appreciate you, uh, to appreciate you being here. And Mark Turner talking about surprises and impact players. He's talking about wide receiver Alameda Zacchaeus. Says, good morning. I'm surprised by OZ's impact this year. Um, I think he's about right where he should be. He's a solid 3-4, um, elevated to number two based on, on this roster, where he'll get the chances. So he's a good professional. Um, so, you know, with the opportunities headed his way, he's making the most of them. And with the Falcons running game and pass protection, it's a good offense to be a wide receiver in. As the wide receivers improve, I think we'll see some of the passing numbers improve. Um, you go and sort through the, the stats on NFL.com or whatnot and look at passing yards, and it, it's pretty stark contrast. The Falcons have about half of the number one. You're like, wait a minute. we're Falcons are still at 900 yards passing versus 1,800 for Josh Allen and Buffalo Bills. That's a lot. Um, but what also is interesting to me is if you sort by rushing offenses, um, I, I did it earlier, I'll remember, but three of the bottom four teams have winning records. Um, so, I mean, as far as the, the worst passing, the worst, the worst passing offensive offenses, I think the, the bears are the worst. And then it's like, uh, the giants, the Falcons and uh, and the Tennessee Titans are the worst passing offenses. Well, those guys have winning records. James Dockery coming on Facebook. Appreciate you being here, James. He says, hey, what's up? Rise up from Kentucky. Absolutely, James. And another happy family, it looks like, in that picture. So um, love seeing these pictures coming in, y'all. Coming in on Facebook like that. 
Dana Miller coming in on YouTube. Says, good morning, everyone. Rise up. Rise up's not going away. That's a that's a Falcons thing. I had someone say, uh, you know, when I I because I still use that picture. There's a picture of a cheerleader holding up a, a rise up picture. I use that a lot across my social media things for Falcons. So I was like, oh, those were stupid old slogans. Yeah, really? Because I've heard the, the pl- current players th- th- uh, say it this year. So to hell with you. We're going to say rise up when we want to. Mark says, <clears throat> the coaches have built a selfless team. And I love it. Uh, it really is. Um, these guys have chips on their shoulders and they have a lot to prove. They're, I, I've said it before. There are... They're, Everyone on this roster, on the 53-man roster, is either on a rookie contract or a one-year deal. So you can say it's a two-year deal, whatever, a three-year. Oh, no, you didn't. Scott Marcus Mariota signed a two-year deal. He did with a $2 million dead cap hit next year against $12 million, $14 million in salary. That's a one-year deal with a club option. So he's on a one-year deal. Um and everybody is like that. They've all got something to prove. Every single one of them. Eli Wilkinson, a retread right tackle, playing over, moved over to left guard, is playing phenomenally. Man's going to get paid. He is earning himself. Probably He'll probably get paid double what he's making this year. Um, right tackle, Caleb McGarry, uh, had his fifth year option declined. So he is a free agent after this year. He's on his rook- he is on his rookie contract and a one-year deal. This is a man who could see his his compensation rise by 5x this year. Part of you says, okay, I'm a little angry that it's taken him this long to get it together. And part of me says, is it time to pay Caleb McGarry? Is it time to start? Hopefully you're, you're, you're having that conversation with his agent right now about a three-year extension in the six to eight million range and see if they bite. You know, let's go three years, 20 million, 15 guaranteed. Here's a $5 million signing bonus. Um, if you put any faith in in uh pff he's playing at a top 20 offensive tackle level that's the numbers that he would be at right tackle he'd be in the six to eight million range i think it's certainly to start to uh you i want kayla mcgarry back is what i'm saying and joe cannon weighing in on the um the beers the beers coming in after the fact he says they deserved it we got the win and they ran for over 100 yards can't ask for more and 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 joe talk about team building the only thing that concerns me really is, is it an over celebration for a, a three and three game? And you, it, sometimes you feel, I don't know if you, if you've worked out or do anything like this, but I swear after I have a personal best, I have a little trouble getting motivated again. I'm like, man, I don't know if I can do that again. It's a mental thing. My only concern is, is it a, a little bit of an over celebration where you then have a let off? I don't think so. But just playing devil's advocate here. Um, the other part of me is uh, I'm also 25 years sober, and I can't do a couple of beers. <laughs> I've always joked. I said the day I want a beer, I will have a beer. I don't want a beer. One beer would piss me off. I would be. It would be. Uh, I don't know if there's any literature fans in here, but. You know, Odysseus going by the sirens when they're calling in and the, the sirens sing this such beautiful song that the sailors can't help themselves and they wreck into the rocks. That's one beer for me. Um, but no, I'm, I was perfectly fine with that. I think it's cool, frankly. Arthur Smith is a former offensive lineman. We've talked about him being a player's coach, but in charge at the same time, like a good father figure. We all know who's in charge. Arthur Smith is in charge, but he is fair. And he is relatable, and the players love playing for him. Man, what more can you ask for uh, right now in, in a head coach? So um, I think uh, I, I agree with you, Joe. I think they deserved it, and I think it was it was very cool. Uh, Kevin's coming in. He says, uh, I don't think having all their players would have changed the game plan one bit. Could the 49ers won if they were healthy? Who cares? Exactly. Um, and as many Falcons fans responded, well, what's your excuse for that 14-point effort on offense? Let's Joey Bosa or less uh, Nick Bosa was playing, you know, tight end. How much did it matter? The Falcons, you're, you're going against by the end of that game, Gir- uh, Jimmy Garoppolo was passing against three reserve cornerbacks. You know, injuries, no excuses. I'm, 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 I'm with you on that, Kevin. No excuses. Um, Joe coming in again on Facebook, he says, Can we talk about Troy Anderson's growth into this defense and how his pass coverage skills don't get talked about enough? I watched him blanket Debo on one play that caused a quarterback hurry. 
Troy Anderson is an uber athlete. He's and and as far as the football instincts, I've said this before. This is a man who won. Uh, I don't care where he's playing. If you're playing at the collegiate level somewhere, he won a conference player of the year as a running back, and he won a conference player of the year as a linebacker. You know what I call those guys? Football players. That's what I call them. And he's got athleticism plus. He is a plus athlete at 240 pounds. You want to talk about, how about him running down, uh, was that on a punt return? Where was it? Hodge Hodge came in really hot and could have wiped the guy out. And uh, was it Ray Ray McLeod made a nice play spinning out of that? Hats off. Great play. I don't put that on Hodge. And oh, Hodge should have made that tackle. Hodge knows he should have made that tackle. The guy made a great play. He's getting paid millions too. Um, but who's down there chasing his ass down? Troy Anderson. 240 pounds of Troy Anderson. Yes, please. Um, there was some concern going into the season that, uh, oh, here he is. Here's another talented guy who's going to get another red shirt season, just like Richie Grant did. Mm-mm. Troy Anderson is being counted on. He's playing good minutes, and he is playing well. James coming in. Since I really hope this coming draft, we upgrade our pass rush. Um, and I'd love to see us. I'd love to see us have a great pass rush. James, I think that is still the number one need on the team. Um, Arnold Ibaketti is playing well. He's still a rookie and he's got a huge upside. There was a tweet. Let me, Nick sent it to me. Um, and I, let me see if I can share it. I sent him a link. He may have sent it to me on my, I've got like 15 Twitter accounts and I usually tell people that it's me. So it's not like just a burner. Um, but it was from Brett Coleman on, on October 17th. He says, Arnold Ebiketti is going to be stupid good. The box score stats will eventually match the tape. He's among all rookies in pressures. He's third among all rookies in pressures with 14 and closing fast, despite having 30 to 50 fewer snaps than number one and number two, which are, uh, Carl Loftus and Aiden Hutchinson. So he's getting to the quarterback. Um, Arnold Ebiketti is. And he was also trusted enough on that third down play. We mentioned this on on Monday that he was dropping into coverage and making a pass breakup. So really, really good player. Need more. Need another one. So, you know, right now, as I'm looking at this team, you know, there's going to be questions about quarterback. There, You know, Marcus Mariota is playing well. Got Desmond Ritter. Right now, I'd say edge. Edge is still my number one priority coming in, James. Um, Lorenzo Carter's on a one-year deal. Like I said, everybody's on a one-year deal or on a rookie contract or both. Um, Edge would still be my priority in in building this team. Albert Knopper's coming in. Albert saying good morning, Scott. Good morning, Albert. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Certainly, uh, certainly appreciate everything you do for this show and all the shows that we do. Thank you so much for taking the time to stop in. Chris Walker weighing in on our question about the offensive line, having some beers up in the suites with head coach, Arthur Smith. I'm going to pour my coffee here a little quick, little shout out to Patrick with LionCoffee.com, keeping us well stocked. This is the coconut roast from LionCoffee.com, And it is damn good. Really good. I wasn't expecting to like it as much as I did. I saved it as one of my third or fourth that I opened up. He sent me a bunch of coffee. And uh, Coconut Rust, LionCoffee.com, check them out. Chris says, well, I think they deserve some recognition for their much improved offensive line play. San Francisco is one of the better front seven, and they played well against them. I think it could be an issue if it becomes a habit, but I don't think it will. Quinn tried too hard to be a player's coach and was too lenient. Arthur Smith believes in putting in hard work and no excuses. He expects the work to be put in and should be rewarded and or praised on occasion. Let's see the future results. Um, and it cuts you off there a little bit, uh, Chris, but you get the gist of it. And like I said, there's a line you want to walk between being a player's coach. Uh, the Denver Broncos fans in here understand what I was saying when I said Arthur Smith is a player's coach because he's fair. The players respect him, but they know who's in charge. They know who is in charge. Arthur Smith is in charge. Terry Fontenot is in charge. Arthur Smith is the face of the team. He's with them every day. General manager has his back. Uh, They work in tandem together. Arthur Smith is in charge. Dean Peace, the coaches are in charge. You know, Dean Peace has 40 years, maybe more, uh, in this this league. And it's a good dynamic. I think one of my warnings when I was, you know, looking at this team coming in into the season 
the offensive line didn't really change personnel. That scared me. I'm like, all right, you know, what are you doing at left guard? Jalen Mayfield is going to have to make a huge leap up. Caleb McGarry is still a huge question mark. Is a Freedy going to be a step up? The trenches, good Lord, what, what's there? It's the same guys. It's, it's Grady Jarrett and everybody else. Fine. Wrong. Okay. Those guys have improved exponentially and have gotten a lot better. But one of my concerns was that people coming into the season with, well, this should be a playoff team. I'm like, Eesh. don't hold those expectations against Arthur Smith if they don't reach them. Because I think Arthur Smith is really good. Throw it all out now. This team can beat anyone. They can be beaten by anyone. Okay, They should be competitive in every game they play. They might have a stinker here and a blowout in the other direction here. But last year, if they weren't worst among point differential teams, they were pretty close. They either won close games or got their asses kicked. This year, they are much better because they are so much better in the trenches. So much better in the trenches. And they will be competitive in all the games they play. And I think people are recognizing what Arthur Smith and his staff and this team that have put together are accomplishing on a shoestring budget with togetherness and good fundamental play. So uh, again, I, I had no problem with them going up and, and getting a, getting a couple beers after, after the game. I think it's cool. Nobody's going to say that, you know, Oh, we got a couple, no one's going to respect Arthur Smith any less. Arthur Smith's still in charge. Terry ocean boy, Martin coming on Facebook with the, Big red falcon. It's probably an eagle, but we're going to call it a falcon in here. And the exclamation points. Terry has to be feeling pretty good about things. Terry is one of the guys that, as I was trying to, uh, you know, talk down expectations a little bit, he'd keep getting a little, little fed up with me. <laughs> but he's still here, and we love him for it. So thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Clayton coming in to rise up. It's the growth of everybody fixing the mistakes, not being the same old falcons. In the beginning, I questioned the scheme from the coaches. It's still borderline trash, but as long as we win, I'm up for it. Rise up. Clayton, I'm a personnel guy um, more so than, uh, you know, than a, than a scheme guy. Um, and again, I, I look at the personnel out there and you're like, what do you, what do you want them to drop back and run an old June Jones run and shoot? You know, um, they're playing a sign of a good coaching staff is playing to the strengths of their team or at least covering up some of the weaknesses and I think this this these guys are doing it incredibly well. Um, last year, I said there was probably four NFL players on this team, plus NFL players on this team, maybe a couple more, maybe. This year, the entire offensive line, I'll throw in there. I'll throw in Drake London. I'll throw in Kyle Pitts. Marcus Mariota is playing at a competent level. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not calling for Desmond Ritter, especially after the way he is running, that, that he is playing and running his offense and getting more and more comfortable. The read options that he having that he's, he's being able to pull off are a thing of beauty. Uh, but they're short. They're short a couple of wide receivers. Still, you got Drake Lennon, and Kyle Pitts. You need two more. Again, um, we've talked about a, a Alameda Zacchaeus earlier in the show. Alameda is a good three, four. I don't want him to be a two. Uh, I want him to be a three, four wide receiver and have a legit number two coming in. You know, we're, we're coming up against uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. You want a T Higgins and a Jamar chase at wide receiver. Um, you know, I, I think back to the old dynasties that I grew up with. First one was the 49ers or even the Steelers was just a shade before my time, but the Steelers was, you know, Stallworth and Swan. Then you go to the 49ers in the eighties and you got John Taylor and Jerry Rice Alvin Harper and Michael Irvin, you know, it goes on and, and on and on. Um, it could use a, uh, use an, another, a little bit more on the wide receiver. And then, then do you want to change how you do your, your quarterback? Again, Marcus Mariota is on a, a one-year deal. He's not going to be an air raid guy, but he can be an efficient dude who can move the chains um, on defense. Do what you can. I mean, the pass rush again is I mentioned is a, a rookie and a journeyman at edge, and then a rookie backup who's not even active that often, and then um, a second year guy in Ogun Deji who's just not very good. God bless him; he's he's not good enough. Uh, and right now, you know, maybe he can make that leap. Taquan Graham made an outstanding leap from his first to his second year. I'm not giving up on him. I'm not saying get rid of him; he's trash. But um, there, the the edge spot needs some help. You go to the inside linebacker. You've got a uh, journeyman in, in Rashawn Evans, a uh, pretty good player in, in Michael Walker. And then you put some, put some draft capital into, uh, into Troy Anderson. 
linebacker looks good. You've got a, a, he's hurt now. Casey Hayward's 30 something years old. He's a short term project safeties. You got Richie Grant and Jalen Hawkins. Okay. Not bad. And then AJ Terrell. But after that, Isaiah Oliver, um, maybe, but I could use, instead of saying, you know, I could use basically someone at any position, my holes are starting to shrink. They're becoming less. I need another corner. Uh, I could use another safety. I need two more edges. Linebacker I'm good with, and I can always use big bodies on the defensive line. Throw anything I just set out and give me Jalen Carter on the defensive line right now, and I'll say yes, please. Uh, the, the big defensive, defensive lineman out of Georgia. Other side, I got to show up my right tackle position. Um, left guard is on a one-year deal. Right tackle is on a one-year deal. But those guys, if they carry over from one year to the next, I'm, I'm fine with. Good with running backs. They're young. Um, in this scheme, they're running hard. I'm okay there. Uh, but then maybe two more wide receivers like to see some bodies come in. That's incredible, honestly. You know, there's there's no – not coming into this off season like we were coming into this last one thinking, oh, my God, there's holes everywhere. You could draft anybody and say it'd fill a need, anybody. Um, it's uh, it's much better. So appreciate the comment, uh, Clayton. Dave coming in says, good morning, Scott. Good morning, Dave. Appreciate you, uh, appreciate you being in. And Chris says, Caleb Hunley has been a find. I'm pleased with his play and effort. Um, watching Caleb Huntley, I uh, there's I don't remember where I heard this phrase or who it was about, but it was a roll. The, the phrase was a rolling ball of butcher knives. That's how I feel watching Caleb Huntley. When you watch him play, all you see as if he's running, as he's running, all you see are knees and elbows and the and the crown of his helmet. And what the hell are you supposed to hit on this guy and not get hurt? So his style of running. It's fun to watch. It's it's very violent, um, which frankly is part of the reason this is the most popular game in the NFL. Let's be serious here. And part of the reason why we kind of buck at the softness of some of the calls we've seen recently. <clears throat> Tom Brady, great Jared. Um, so I like the way he plays as well. And he was a guy who was on a practice squad two weeks ago. So do I want to dump a bunch of money into the running or, or draft capital into the running back spot? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, Nick, my partner on the show would say running backs don't matter. I'm leaning that way, man. I'm, I am, um, you got Tyler Algier as a fifth round pick playing well. And you got Caleb Huntley who was on the practice squad last year and was elevated two weeks ago playing well. Also, um, are they long-term answers? Maybe. Is there a long-term answer at running back or are they three years at most? So, uh, Caleb Huntley, I agree with you, Chris. Uh, James Dockery says, I would love to see Kyle Pitts get more involved as well. Seems like he's not getting enough touches. I think we all can agree on that. Um, his ability down the field and run after the catch is what made him the highest drafted tight end in the history of the NFL to begin with. Um, but I don't want Mariota forcing the ball. I, I don't, I haven't watched all 22 on the Falcons to say, okay, he's open and he's not being looked at. He's the number one threat. And I have a feeling he's getting extra special attention. And I also think it's one of the reasons why Drake London is the number five PFF graded wide receiver in the entire NFL. In the entire NFL, Drake London is number five. Man, what value you're getting that on a rookie contract. That's a $25 million a year guy that you've got on a rookie contract. Uh, nice work. Nice job. As critical as I was of the draft pick. If you get if you get guys that can play when it, depend forget need throw need out the window, if you keep stacking good players, you're going to be just fine. And Drake London right now is a hit. Um, talk about that, uh, that that other wide receiver that will help. Uh, Drake London I think is seeing some of the benefits of Kyle Pitts being gang covered and <clears throat> another weapon. You know uh, another number two. I don't even want to say his name, but another guy like Calvin Ridley, it ain't going to be Calvin Ridley, but another big threat for a wide receiver. And this, this, this offense is, you'll see more open up for, uh, for, uh, for Mr. Pitts. I agree with you. Um, and Mark Turner says outside a couple of players, no one knows who our players actually are. It is. It's there was a, uh, I don't remember who it was, but they, you know, they called it the no name defense. Oh, ironic. I don't remember who it was. Um, but that, that's kind of how this is. It's, it is the no-name guys. A.J. Terrell and Grady Jarrett are, are fairly well-known. Um, after that, mm -mm. no. 
they're, they're, those are the only two guys on the defense that have any kind of name recognition outside of Falcons fans. Marcus Mariota is a, a known because he was drafted so high and a quarterback. Same with Kyle Pitts. And Drake London is starting to be that way. Um, Jake Matthews has been around a long time. So, you know, people recognize his, his name. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's made a Pro Bowl or two in his career. Um, people will know the name Chris Lindstrom. Uh, if, if you can talk about Quentin Nelson with the Indianapolis Colts, you should be talking about Chris Lindstrom. If I can talk about Lindstrom, uh, Nelson as a guard, I can talk about Lindstrom. Um, believe it or not, in this weekend's game against the 49ers, Lindstrom had the worst grade from PFF. Now, I've been praising the guys doing grades for PFF. Um, <laughs> but that made me look at it. It's like, what? You couldn't have Chris Lindstrom being the number one rated interior lineman in the NFL, so you had to bump him down? Because it was like a 49. His grade was terrible. I'm like, I, I didn't, didn't see that. He may not have had his absolute best game, but I didn't see an F type of grade. All right, y'all. We've caught up on the chat a little bit. So if you got anything else you want to jump into, but I want to I want to talk a little bit about the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, the Cincinnati Bengals were an anomaly last year, and the, one of the reasons I don't like anomalies is because fans then always use the anomaly as a reason to think that it's going to happen again, and it could, but it, it's an anomaly for a reason. When we start talking about having awful offensive line play, yeah, but look at the Bengals. Yeah, but look at the Bengals. The Bengals were 10 and 7 and eked into the playoffs and, and got on a decent run. They weren't necessarily a good team. That carried over again this year. Uh, they're three and three. They were 10 and 7 last year, so just a barely above 500. That's where they are this year. They've got some great skill players, but they're still susceptible in the trenches. They're still they, they Joe Burrow has been sacked 21 times and rushed for over 100 yards, so he has been under duress this year. Um, the Falcons are getting a better pass rush. Um, I think they're at eight or nine sacks, which is way ahead of last year, and they should have had one more that was taken away by a bogus uh, roughing the passer flag. So we're talking about Arnold Ibiketti, Lorenzo Carter, maybe get a little D'Angelo Malone in there. The interior pass rush that Grady Jarrett has been getting, get some heat on Joe Burrow, and I think it is definitely a possibility um, to go in there and win this game. Like I said, I think the Falcons can beat anybody. Uh, they can be beaten by anybody, too. So this is they'll be competitive in every single game. But they're six-point underdogs, which is a lot for me. That, that seems high. Um, Vegas hasn't bought in on the Atlanta Falcons yet. Uh, the NFL power rankings are starting to come around. They are inching their way up to middle of the, of the pack. Win over the 49ers helped. ESPN was lowest on the Falcons. They had them at 32 to start the season. Moved them up a couple of spots after dominating the Saints for three and a half quarters and losing. Then dropped them back to 32 after losing to the Rams on the road when they had the ball and a chance to win. Like, does that look like the worst team in the NFL to you? The, the team you just watched in LA? So I felt like ESPN had a preconceived notion and was trying to force fit that into there, despite the way the Falcons were playing, which was they were playing well. They weren't playing like the worst team in the league by any stretch of the imagination. Now they're up to about 19, I think 18 on NFL.com, and I think 17 on PFF. Three and three, there's a host of three and three teams out there. But the Falcons are fundamentally sound enough and strong enough in the trenches to play close games with anyone and six points seems like a lot to me with the Cincinnati Bengals um where are the Cincinnati Bengals uh vulnerable on defense well good news Falcons fans the running game um let me see if I have the the numbers in front of me I had them pulled up earlier but they gave up a boatload of yards to um in the last two weeks you know good rushing attacks uh but they gave up uh, probably the this auto playing video on pro football reference is a new thing and I hate it. They gave up 228 yards uh, rushing to the New Orleans Saints. They gave up 155 yards rushing to the Baltimore Ravens. What do you think the Falcons do well? We know. We know what they do well. Um, they run the ball. So can you run the ball on them? Yes, you can. And can you, as Mark Turner comes in here and says, my Warriors are wide receivers, or if we can cover them okay. 
that should be a worry for everybody, Mark. That That is a worry, especially with uh, Casey Hayward being out. That's a, a, a bit of a scary uh, proposition. The best pass defense in the world is a quarterback on his ass. Um, and Joe Burrow spends a lot of time under duress, so if you can limit the big plays, you can pressure this guy. Three or four sacks on him, and we're talking about uh, you know three or four sacks, establish the running game, clean game from, from Marcus Mariota, and you can go into Cincinnati and get the win. Just eight hours up 75, Atlanta Falcons fans, and you're in Cincinnati. Um, it's, uh, you, can, you can run up there real quick and, and, and pull off the upset. Falcons have been underdogs in every game they have played this year. Um, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be. I think I've picked against them in all every game they've played this year. Um, but I'm a believer now in this team as far as their ability to cope over the long haul uh, if they stay relatively healthy. Just because, again, they're they're so much better in the trenches. I'll say it a zillion times because that was where I did not expect them. The reason why I didn't think they'd be very good is because they were awful in the off, in the offensive and defensive line last year, and they didn't do a lot to address those concerns, and they got better. Hats off to this coaching staff. Hats off to the players uh, like Taquan Graham, like Caleb McGarry, to Terry Fontenot for finding Eli Wilkinson and converting him from right tackle to left guard. Um Drew Dahlman stepping up and going through his growing pains, getting better week to week. Um, Jake Matthews for having some help to his right this year, where he didn't last year, and playing much better. Uh, and then Chris Lindstrom taking that next step to being an all-pro level, um, not pro bowl, all-pro level guard. Joe Cannon comes and he says, Grady and TQ should have really good games against that interior uh, offensive line the Bengals have. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if I'm worried about D'Angelo Malone um, in coverage or, you know, against a run, forget it. Let's, let's get, let's get the rook out there. Who's, who's a little bouncy, a little twitchy and see if he can't go get the quarterback in some passing situations. And Lorenzo Carter, go have a game, dude, go, go have a game. Arnold of announce yourself to the world defensive line front five of the Atlanta Falcons could have a big game. And if they do, you're not as worried about Darren Hall and the loss of Casey Hayward and the matchups of those big wide receivers uh, against the Falcons secondary. It should be a really good game. I think six is a little bit high. Uh, of, I, you know, I always say when, you, when you've got like an emotional attachment to a team, and I've grown up in Atlanta, I was a Falcons fan my whole life, um, it makes it hard to pick games. I'm good at picking other games when I can just be robotic about it. But six seems like a lot to me. So I would take the points in this one. I would take the Falcons and the points. And, uh, and trust on them to be able to keep a game close. They've only played one game that wasn't a one-score game this year. And six, one and six, and they won it. It was this last one. They beat the 49ers by 14. The other five games were all one-score games. So um, I, I, like, uh, I like the Falcons uh, with the points in this game. On that note, y'all, um, we're going to get out of here. We're about 45 minutes. And again, if you're watching after the fact, leave me a comment. Make sure you're hitting that like, subscribe, share button. I know we, again, I had about 80% of my traffic was on demand uh, on the on our last video. So say hi. We'll say hi back if you're listening. We appreciate you being here. And everybody who is coming in here um, and being part of the live show, I love you for it. It makes it so much easier and so much more fun. And it's the reason why we do them live instead of just recording a podcast. We do live shows because of you. So thank you for being here, everybody. Um, on that note, it's Wednesday. Uh, I will be back on Broncos for breakfast with Eric Trickle tomorrow morning. If you want to talk some of the problems on the offensive line in the trenches that the Denver Broncos are facing and how that matriculates across the rest of the team. And then we will be back on Monday, probably, if not, we'll go Tuesday. Follow me on Twitter at Scout Kennedy to make sure I have run into some passport problems and have to go to New Orleans to get my passport renewed before I can go to London for the Jacksonville uh, Denver Broncos game. Um, and I'll say hi as people are coming in. Uh, Eric coming in. Denzel Tillery says, got here late, but appreciate you, my man. We appreciate you being here. If I if I messed up your name, but it looks like Eric to me. Just a very unique spelling, which is cool because, you know, we had boring names like Scott growing up. So I always like... Uh, a, a little uniqueness to a name. So welcome in. Appreciate you being here. On that note, I'm going to fly. Uh, check out allfalcons.com. There will be a, a good article from Aiden coming out here in the next hour. 
Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. Leave us a comment. I love interacting with people and talking sports. It sure beats working for a living. So on that note, appreciate you being here, and we'll see you next time.